Well, welcome to week three, and today we're going to talk a little bit about corporate worship in small groups and what that means for us as Methodists. So, like we started the last few weeks, um, I have a question for you that I want you to to write down or to think about um, wherever you are at. Um, The first question is, what is worship to you? And I put worship in parentheses for a reason. Um, What is worship to you? Um, And I want you to write that down. Maybe what does worship look like? How do you worship? Um, What does that look like to you? All right, so that's the first question. The next question is, have you ever been a part of a small group? Whether it be inside of a church, whether it be outside of a church, whether it be in the community. Um, what, have you ever been a part of a small group and what was it like? Um, what was it like? Um, what experience did you have? And what benefits did it provide for you? Um, what did it do to you? What did it do to, to your family if you were in the, the group as a whole? And I want you to write that down. What was that like? So I want to start with corporate worship and then move into small groups. Um, This is what corporate worship, why we do corporate worship. We do worship because we know that we can't do faith on our own. As much as we think we can, um, as much as we want to think about God and worship God, whatever that might look like, we do corporate worship, meaning worship together, whether that be online, digitally, or in person. We do that together because we can't do faith on our own. Now, in worship, we do this thing called liturgy. And liturgy literally means the work of the people during worship. So you'll have different people in the style of worship that we have as Methodists um, doing different works and acts in which they connect with God and worship God. So you'll have prayers, you'll have announcements, you'll have the call, a call to worship, you might sing, um, you might have a children's message, you have different parts of the body, um, not just clergy, that are, help, that are actively engaged in worship. And that liturgy, um, what we often call liturgy, is the work of the people. Now, when we're in worship, it's not just supposed to be a passive thing. Um, it's something that we're supposed to be actively engaged with. So sometimes when we go, when we go to a worship or a worship service, um, we sit down, we sit for an hour, we listen to music, we listen to a, a message, and then we leave. Yet worship is something to be very different. It's not supposed to be passive. It's supposed to be something that we are actively doing, whether we are praying ourselves, whether we're taking notes on a sermon, whether we are praying to God, um, whether we are uh, singing together, whether we are connecting with a call to worship or praying together or reading scripture together. Worship is meant to be an active thing where you are engaged as much as I am engaged. It's an active thing that we do together. So what makes worship worship? Um, Worship for us as Methodists is a time in which we praise the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship and remember these stories that we have, that we found in Scripture. And worship is often when we gather as multiple people, whether it be digital or online, we gather together and we worship together as the body of Christ. Um, For Methodists, there are four primary elements of worship, and these look very different based upon every different church, even individual churches, even different services found in different churches. But there are four kind of basic elements of worship, and we can have a, again, we can have a whole class on this as well, but I'll give you the four basic elements. The first one is that we gather together, whether we're in the same chat room or whether we're in the same uh, YouTube room, whether we are um, gathering together in different time periods. If I'm watching a YouTube video and somebody else is watching a YouTube video at a different time, um, or we gather together in person, we are gathering together. And then there's a proclamation of the word, whether that be through reading of scripture, whether that be a sermon, whether that be through singing, whether that be through a call to worship, there's a proclamation of the word. And then there's a response to the word. So after a sermon or after, a mu- after music, there's some sort of response, whether that be um, communion, whether that be an offering, whether that be a response that you say amen, there's some sort of responsive feature to the pro- proclamation of the word. And then there is a sending forth. When we come to church, we don't just sit here and we experience this and then we leave. The the sending forth, you are shaped and changed by by the word, by the response to the word, and you are sent forth to bring the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. There is this this, this sending forth of you to go and do your thing where spirit is guiding you, whether that be at work, whether that be at home, whether that be in whatever you do, you are sent to the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to go and transform the world. So that's kind of the basic elements of worship as Methodists. Now, for us, I've got a a little example about what a traditional service looks like for us at Mandarin Longleaf. 
In a normal traditional service, uh, it looks like this. We start with announcements. We tell a little about what's going on during the week. We have an opening prayer. And then we have a prelude, so there might be a mus musical piece that's not singing together, but there's a prelude. And then we have a call to worship where uh, the leader might say something and the participants or the congregation would say something as well, proclaiming who God is. And then there's a hymn of praise. Then we have the affirmation of faith. It might be the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, some sort of creed that we all say together. And then we might have the Glory Patry, which we sing and then we'd have an anthem. It could be uh, music. It could be a video. It could be um, different musicians playing. It, it could be anything, but it's some sort of musical piece that inspires us to connect with God. And then we have a pastoral prayer where somebody leads us in prayer for our local community, the community uh, of our nation, the community around the world. And then we pray the Lord's Prayer together at the end of that. And then we oftentimes have a children's message. So somebody would come up and they would uh, try to speak directly to the children, trying to tie in all the stuff that we're doing in this particular service. And then we have a reading of scripture um, that oftentimes correlates with the message. Then we have a sermon or a message in which the pastor um, or the lay person kind of preaches about how they see this word of God impacting us. And then we have another hymn or a closing hymn, which we sing. And then we have a benediction where you are sent forth in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or go forth in grace and hope and love and peace. And then as you are leaving, there is this postlude that kind of guides you out. So that's a quick version for us in our traditional service. Our, our modern service looks different. Our contemporary service looks different. The experiences you've had, whether that be at a Methodist church or a Catholic church or an Anglican church or an Episcopalian church or a Baptist church, or Episcopal church, they all are going to look a little different. Um, but for us, we follow kind of this fourfold rule of worship of how we respond to the word, we experience the word, we are sent forth and we are gathered together. But for this particular circumstance, I want to talk about active worship versus passive worship. And when I look at this, I would say there are certain parts of the worship that is active and certain parts of the worship of worship that are passive. And sometimes we become a little more passive because we just want to sit there in our movie theater seats and enjoy worship versus being active and engaged in worship. So the parts in blue are more passive for us. So the announcements, the prelude, the anthem, the uh, children's message, the scripture message, unless you're, if you're taking notes and really engaging with it, I think it can be active. The benediction, the postlude, sometimes those are more passive where you sit in your seat and you receive. Yet the orange, the call to worship, the hymn of praise, the affirmation of faith, the pa when we pray the Lord's Prayer together, when we sing together, those are the active pieces of worship in which the work of the people or the liturgy is happening. And all of us in, this, in that room, whether we're online, when we're engaging in worship, we are all together praising the triune God and worshiping the triune God in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what worship is for us. Now, when you look in our hymnal, the United Methodist hymnal, there's a section in the very front that, at, that talks about Wesley's rules for singing. And these are the rules that Wesley told all of his people early on in the 1700s and early 1800s about reading, about singing um, in worship. Now, uh, they're fascinating because I think they're just wonderful and beautiful. And I'm going to read them for you. The first rule of singing from Mr. Wesley. Learn these tunes before you learn any others. Before you learn any others, you learn these ones. The second one, you sing them exactly as they are printed here without altering or mending them at all. You cannot change any words. He was very strict. The third one, sing all. You can't just pick and choose. Sing all and see that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. The fourth one, sing lustily and with a good courage. <laughs> Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. <laughs> I can't imagine somebody just... Oh, like sing lustily is what Mr. Wesley would say. The next one, to the antithesis of this, sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation that you may not destroy the harmony. Now, if you have been to worship or even singing at all or been to a concert, you know that one person that sings really loud and they're fully off key and they, they, they ruin the entire thing. That's what John Wesley would say, sing modestly and do not bawl. If you are one of those people that sings really loud, just, just lower it down a few notches. Number six, sing in time. Whatever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Do not run before nor stay behind it and take care not to sing too slow. We all know that person that can't keep beat. And for that person that can't keep beat, 
this is a really hard one for you, but when we sing, we sing together, and you sing on the same timeline, the same time frame. You're not ahead of somebody or behind somebody because it throws off the harmony. Number seven, above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God uh, in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing him more than yourself or any other creature. Uh, That is the most important thing about scripture. I I read these because I think they're really funny, but we sing because we're trying to praise God, and you sing with everything you have in trying to praise God, Um, and I think it's just beautiful. So that's a little bit about corporate worship. The next piece is about small groups, and there's a short video that I want you to watch. It's from another church, um, and it's just a really cool video about small groups. So take a look. There are some things in life that you can't do alone, like play ping pong. Yeah, baby. Give yourself a root canal. Be stuck in a traffic jam. Are you serious? Come on! Perform a flash mob. Have a sack race. Set, go! Go on a lunch date. Trust fall. Okay, here I go. Falling. Some things in life just don't work without the help of others. Your spiritual journey is one of them. That's one of my favorite videos. It's so, so good. It's so funny. Uh, I don't remember what church it was. Uh, I found it on YouTube. Uh, If this is your church uh, and I'm stealing this from you and you see this, I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me borrow it. Um, But why are small groups so important? Uh, First, we can't do life alone. It's important to have people that can be there there for us at all of our times and the joys and the low parts of our life. That's that's a part of faith. We do this faith thing with other people. And you know that when we gather together, we grow from our conversations with one another, with people that see things a little differently than us. Um, We challenge one another. We ask each other good questions and we grow when we are together. And we learn more from people when we do disagree. Uh, when you have that hard conversation that you might steam, steam afterwards, that, that small group meeting, you're like, I, I need to think more about this and have a response. Yeah, you oftentimes learn more when somebody disagrees with you in a civil way. And then one of the most important parts of a small group is that we care for one another. You have people that if something happens, you can have that phone call with them. Or you might have somebody bring you a casserole or bring you a meal for some particular reason. Or you had a baby and somebody brings you that meal. Uh, it's just, that's what a small group does. You, we, you care for one another and it changes you. And that's what the life of faith is about. It's about a community of faith that surrounds you in the good times and the rough times. All right. So we've talked a little bit about corporate worship. We talked a little bit about small groups and why both of those are important in our life of faith. So we have our question again, or our takeaway. Um, What is one thing you have learned in our time together? What's one thing that stuck out? What's one thing maybe you relearned? Maybe you knew this thing, but you forgot about it and you relearned it again tonight. What is that one takeaway from our time together? And I want you to write it down or, or think about it if you're listening to the podcast. All right, so there's a little bit of homework for you for week four. Uh, we're going to have to either watch the, watch the next video or listen uh, on the podcast to the week four video. We're going to talk about gifts um, and generosity. And uh, you're also going to read week four um, gifts and generosity um, for the next week. So that's the end of week three. We are glad that you are with us, and we will see you next week. <laughs>